Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. We are back for another episode and this time we are going to be previewing the Brazilian Grand Prix. I am one of your hosts, Timo Alves Davy, and I am joined, as always, by my two excellent co-hosts, Jesse Billington and Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you both? Um, good, thank you. I've had the day off work today, which is always nice. And I made a great dinner tonight as well, so... What was on the menu? It was crispy potatoes... Roasted carrot, some purple sprouting broccoli, and some chicken and mushroom scallops. All made by moi. Oh, that does sound good. Mm, it yeah, was. Not bad at all. How are you, Jesse? Um, finally dry is the best way of stating it. I uh, spent most of yesterday, yesterday being Sunday, stood on Madeira Drive in Brighton, photographing and writing up the London to Brighton veteran car run, which for listeners outside the UK is a run for cars from pre-1905, celebrating the emancipation of cars when they removed the four mile an hour legal speed limit about 122 years ago. And basically, it's very, very old cars, usually fueled by not typical petrol sort of things. So you had steam cars, diesel cars, electric cars, anything running on things like acetylene, sort of basically chugging the 60 miles from Hyde Park to Brighton. And it absolutely chucked it down. So I was drenched. So without speed limit, it's nearly as quick as uh, last year's Hass. It's, uh, yeah, nearly as quick as last year's Hass or just about as fast as the trains will get you there these days. So, Yeah. But it is not just the three of us tonight. We are joined by a special guest inside F2 is Jenny Craig. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Very excited for this weekend. Lovely yeah, race. Makes, the best one for the of weekend. So we will just launch right into it with our new section, What the Hell Has Happened? And as predicted by moi a few weeks ago, Frederick Vesti will drive for Mercedes in the Abu Dhabi Young Drivers Test. And... Uh, Jenny, I'm going to kick it right off with you as we've got an F2 driver and F2 expert here. What do you think? Uh, I'm happy, to be honest. I think this year in F2, he's had a really strong season and he's taken me by surprise. I was actually a little bit pessimistic at the start, <laughs> um, but in a very good way. I'm very surprised. And I think the way that he's handled F2 this year with a really, really strong teammate in Pateo Porsche, I think it's very mm. well deserved. It's going to be very interesting to see what he can do in the Mercedes for sure, because unlike Red Bull, Mercedes don't really have a lot of drivers in the pipeline, especially at this level. So it's going to be very interesting to see what his future could look like in a few years and how much this will impact it. I think in that sense, he's in a very good position since he's not got that much competition, as whereas the Red Bull Academy have got so many drivers in F2. He's As long as he does well in the tests and carries on doing the way he is in F2 if he's in it next year I think he's in a very good position It's going to be a busy end of the month for him but in the off season it is not just going to be but it's busy early May Yes Valtteri Bottas is joining two-time F1 world champion Mika Hakkinen for the race of champions which is being held in Sweden in January next year for those who don't know what it is, the Race of Champions is an annual event that brings together drivers from multi motorsport disciplines and everyone has equal machinery, so it's all down to the driver. Race of Champions is for the individual and then a Race of Champions Nation Cup is when two drivers from the same country pair up to be the fastest country. Those also joining Bottas is Sebastian Vettel, who's previously done it and won. And he's also teamed up with both Michael and Mick Schumacher and also Nico Hulkenberg as well. Jamie Chadwick and Johan Christofferson will also be driving, but Bottas is hoping to have the edge over the others. Of this year, it's being built on the frozen Baltic Sea. So it'll have a combination of snow and ice, which he has experience of after previously driving in Arctic rallies and the 2020 Turkish Grand Prix. So it's going to look like a good event. <laughs> I'm also just picturing that ice lake from the latest episode of the Grand Tour and hoping it's not the same one. Yes, yeah, hopefully it's a bit thicker and a bit less sinky, especially if you're in a, uh, what is it, Mitsubishi Evo. Um, who's Jamie Chadwick driving with then? Or is she with Christoph? They haven't said. Christoph's oh, right. Swedish, so I don't think... I was gonna, I was just, <laughs> she said the two names next to each other. For clarity's sake, I was just making sure that the listeners knew. I obviously knew that. <laughs> I think David Coulthard's one before there I think he was there this year but I can't remember if, they think if one of them was just watching or not because I couldn't I caught the last day of it so it's mm. uh, maybe DC wouldn't be surprised to see him back there 
Yeah. Yeah, they're slowly announcing the driver lineup. So at the minute, they're sort of the they're pro- well, probably other big names, but they're the ones that I knew the best. They won't so. matter probably because Sebastian Loeb and do what Sebastian Loeb does. So. <laughs> But Jesse, other news for the F2 and F3 world in the meantime? Yes, we've had the F2 and F3 calendars for the season coming 2023. They've uh, Both calendars have been released. Obviously, we already knew both were going to Australia. And Formula 3 is heading to Monaco for the first time. We've had F2 there before. We've even had Formula E there for a couple of times, slightly different circuit. But the one thing we know is, especially with F2 and Formula E, the smaller, nippier cars produce some good racing around the streets of Monte Carlo. So the question is, Will F3 bring just as much excitement? I would say more. What do you think, Benny? Smaller cars, more of them as well. A bit of rain on the on there as well. Absolutely. It's 30, I can't imagine even 30 cars going around Monaco. So that's going to be something really interesting to watch. <laughs> I, I think can imagine a lot of yellow at all, flags. Will be 30 cars by the end of it, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be one of those races where you hear the commentators using the phrase race of attrition quite a lot. I can see that being a, a popular one for Alex Jakes. 100%. Um, one of the new drivers joining for that race and for the rest of the season, indeed, will be Gabriel Mini, who will drive for high tech in Formula 3 next year. He is the 2022 Frecker vice champion. So as we've seen pretty much the last few years, you do well in Freca, you're going to step up to F3. So nice that we see that fresh talent coming through and be interesting to see what he can do. It's interesting because another driver that has been retained uh, for next year is Gregoire Saucy for ART. And he did very well in Freca, but then this year in his rookie season for Formula 3, didn't do quite as well as a lot of people maybe expected, which shows perhaps it's not as easy as some of the other rookies made it look to just come into F3 and be stonkingly good at it so only time will tell to see what Mini can do about it Equally at the same time I think this year's F3 bunch has been fiercely competitive especially at the top end of the field you look at how tightly packed they've been through quite a lot of the the season so if you're going to try and look good in that, you've got to really excel to be up in that sort of top field and not get caught up with a lot of the, the sort of chaos that seems to stem below them. So, uh, yeah, seeing how we've got, obviously, a Frecker a vice champion, that is a fun phrase, um, stepping up to the mark. It'll be interesting. And again, high tech, pretty solid team to start driving for. They seem to, they know their onions, I think, when it comes to the junior series. So it'll be a good starting point for Gabrielli. And in yet more Red Bull news, Eddie May, but luckily and mostly something slightly different from what we've been having lately. Yes. Christian Horner has admitted that Red Bull have previously held exploratory talks with Lando Norris to become a driver for them on more than one occasion. But ironically, whenever they've opened up talks, he signed a contract with McLaren the very next day. I think at that moment, it seems obvious why Lando would stick with McLaren because he's developed a lot as a driver, both under Zac Brown and McLaren themselves. And he's been there a while now. He's comfortable with how they work. He's built the team around him. Whilst if you move to Red Bull, Verstappen at the minute is going to always be favoured. So it doesn't seem logical why Lando would want to move into that kind of environment. And he's also he also believes that McLaren could win a championship in the future. However, in the past few years, they've sort of stayed pretty stagnant as a midfield team. And Orlando in a few years, admittedly, he will be, what, in his mid-20s. But would he start to get itchy feet and think about moving to a team like Red Bull? At the risk of saying something controversial, which I know is very unlike me, another reason for Lando to perhaps stay with McLaren and not want to go anywhere is because at the moment he's he's quite comfortable where he is. As you say, he's been there a long time. He's embedded within the team. Whereas if he went to Red Bull, either now or at any point in the recent past, he might have had to work a damn sight harder than he currently is because just of what Red Bull expect and what being Max Verstappen's teammate does to a person and to one's soul. Um, So... He might just like the idea of at the moment he can he's doing a lot of stuff outside of racing and can focus on that and can get away with that. But I think if he was at Red Bull, he might not have as much leeway and possibly wouldn't have the mental capacity to do it either because of being that second Red Bull driver. 
I well, think as saying... well, oh, sorry. <laughs> and I was going to say, I think as well, um, for a youngish driver going into a team like Red Bull, it's so early on in their career. I think he's, we've all seen what it's done to Gasly's career and Albon's career and go into the Red Bull in this kind of environment that they have now that's focused around Max. But if you don't do, say, like what Perez has done and what Ricardo's done, if you don't do that or even close, you won't have a seat next year. So it could put him in a bit of a situation like Ricardo's currently in where you want to stay in a fun, but then the seat from McLaren if he ever wanted to go back or if he wanted to go anywhere else, it could close up quite quickly. And then the thing that it's done with Gasly and Albon, you could argue that teams have seen them a lot less favourably than they might have if they'd have started somewhere else. Like Gasly's got his reputation back up now, but we all saw what it did in 2020. 2020. So it's been a long road to get back to this point for him. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't something that Lando would want or any driver. Yeah, why, why rock the boat when you're perfectly comfortable? <laughs> exactly. Last week, a couple of weeks ago, he did DJ for Red Bull, Lando. So maybe he's worming his way in. <laughs> he's that not is, burning all his bridges. It's the beginning of the most far-fetched theory for this podcast, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to add something there, Jesse, no? No, no, just saying he's not really burning all his bridges. I think more on a more sort of technical aspect it is this case of Lando appreciates what he's got with the McLaren. He's got the security. He is essentially the Max Verstappen at McLaren he is the dominant driver he's the one the team is focused around building cars around sort of basically running the ship around what Lando wants and if you're in that position as a Formula One driver you you're not going to really want to walk away from that unless things start to go horribly wrong if McLaren really starts to drop down the down the pecking order a bit I can see him potentially getting itchy feet and deciding to potentially look somewhere else but at the moment he's getting a podium every season or so every season. He's getting decent points most races. He's in a car that he can compete with and drive well in and, again, keep himself at the forefront of the sport. So should that happen, he's got a good three, four years at that point of really top-tier driving, bringing home some decent podium finishes to say, go on then, Red Bull, if you really fancy it, you know exactly what I'm like on track. You've seen the talent over these four years. You've seen me develop as a driver. He's got a few more cards in his hand to play as opposed to Red Bull simply wanting a young, fast driver who is essentially got a lot more time left to work as Max Verstappen's underling than potentially they see Sergio Perez has. Talking of drivers that are trying to capitalise on the future, Dennis Hauger, Jenny, has decided to join MP Motorsport in Formula 2 for 2023. He's moving there from Prima, of all teams, after getting two wins so far this year. Drogovic effect are we putting it down to? MP Motorsport capitalising on this success? Um, I'm actually really happy about this news because I've been very intrigued at what Hauger can do in his second season. I think MP going as possibly champions next year. I think him joining that team, I think, is such a good thing for him. And they seem very friendly and very mm. well, just from an outside perspective. <laughs> I don't know them personally, but um, I think that's a really good thing that for Hauger because he's had a lot of pressure on his shoulders this season going in as champion. And then he's come in very much as Piastri did. And I think a few of us have expected him to do a Piastri the way that he dominated F3. But I think we saw how he was in his second season in F3. I just, for his sake and for his career, I would like to see him do that again with a with MP. Be quite a year next year if he does manage to pull that one off. I can see it, you know. Um. Manifest it, Jenny, manifest it. <laughs> and the final bit of F2 news for this week at least is that Zane Maloney, who if you've listened to our F3 triple header review recently, he's a boy from Barbados, don't you know? Um, he's going to race for Trident in the final round of the Formula 2 season this year in Abu Dhabi, and he's going to be replacing Caelan Williams, who the team dropped a couple of weeks ago. And we kind of see this over the last few years as some particular drivers from F3 because of the big gap in between the penultimate and final rounds of Formula 2. You see a couple of people from F3 having to go for the weekend to see what they can do, Jack do, and being the notable example from last year's crop to before he stepped up properly this year. And uh, what do you think, Jenny, again, what do you think he's capable of? He did quite a good job in Formula 3 this year. 
I think it's a great time for him to do it um, from what he did in the last half of the season. He won pretty much every feature race he could have. Three feature race back to back since yeah. the last time for the Monza. So somehow just kept pulling them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think he's got the momentum behind him. And I think I'd like to see him somewhere other than Trident personally. Maybe I think after the season that he had in F3, I'd like to see him more up the field. Um, but I am a little bit gutted about Williams because I think for a first season against someone like for sure, I think he's actually done quite well. So I'd like to see him on the grid back next year if if he can. Yeah, he's, he's a driver that seems to have a lot of everything in the background really put together in terms of just funding and sponsors and just do getting all your ducks in a row and it's just he needs the on track stuff now and we know most sport could be pretty brutal at times with how it chops and changes drivers but it seemed like they were building something quite nice with him so it'd be a shame if that all came to an end quite so abruptly 100 percent. and jesse on a different note on a slightly more peeved note, uh, the final F1 sprint of the season will take place in Brazil this weekend coming. And uh, we've all got a pretty flat tone when it comes to the sprints. None of us are particularly enthralled by them. None of us find them particularly beneficial to the overall racing. All it seems to do is stretch out that dull middle section of the Grand Prix just by essentially adding another 20-odd laps to the dull middle bit. Um, and equally, Autosport are reporting that Max Verstappen doesn't see the need for any more of them in the future. And... You know what? I'm going to side with Max on this one. I think he's. I think. I think these. I think he's right there. It's. I just don't like him. I can't see the point of them. Yes, you get racing on the sun Saturday, but that's what F2 and F3 is for and W series. But yeah, I, it's just more in a F1 race that is moves all the excitement away from the Sunday, as far as I see it. So the listeners know exactly what the three of us think of it, but you never know, Jenny. Are you are you going to be an advocate for the sprint race? Or are you with us on this one? <laughs> Very dull. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, and we're swiftly on. We won't waste any more time on the sprint. <laughs> Ellie May, one more bit of news before we let Jesse go with his history lesson. Yes, I mean, it kind of is a history lesson, but a different one. Um, Maro Forgeri, sorry if I said that completely wrong. I think that's how you say it. He's passed away aged 87. He, uh, after graduating with a doctorate in mechanical engineering, Enzo Ferrari insisted that he should join Ferrari where he worked on engines, gearboxes, chassis and their suspensions. And after a coup from a lot of the Ferrari design team leading them to leave, Fulgari was thrusted into being in charge of all motorsport activity and testing for Ferrari in 1961. And after employing John Surtees as their driver in 1963, Ferrari took the Drivers and Constructors Championship in 64, but after the Ford Cosworth engine came into force, force, Ferrari kind of fell back. But under Fulgari, Ferrari were the first team to design an aerodynamic rear wing, which they brought to the 1968 Belgian Grand Prix, leading to driver Chris Amon to do a lap time four seconds quicker than the rest of the, the, te- the rest of the drivers to take pole position and Jackie Ix just missed out on the championship by five points in 1970 which was the year that Joachim Ritt famously won the championship who's the only driver to win a championship yes I can't say that word (laughs) (laughs) it's one of those tricky ones because all the vowels aren't where you expect them yes and after designing the transversal transmission in 1975, which created a really great weight distribution in the car, Nicky Lauda won the Drivers' Championship in both 75 and 77, with Ferrari winning the Constructors in 75, 76, and 77, with obviously 76 being the year where we had the great battle between Nicky Lauda and James Hunt. Um, Fogeri was one of the last all round engineers in the F1 world, and during his time at Ferrari, Fogeri led Ferrari into winning four drivers' championships with Jody Schechter winning the fourth in 1979 with teammate Gilles Verneuve in second. And it was either eight or seven constructors' championships. It's seven. Two, 
Although you can chalk the eight one up to his because he left left Ferrari halfway through the final one, so it was like his yeah. work that did it, but he wasn't actually there when they finished it. Yes, yes. So he he was essentially a very big part of the ancestry of Ferrari, and our thoughts basically go out to his his family. He was such a sort of important sort of mainstay in Ferrari that he actually, in 2021, I think I'm right in saying, was made an honorary citizen of Modena as well, of course, where Ferrari are based. Wouldn't surprise me at all. No, and um, I mean, in in sort of more road car stuff, I know he was um, fundamental in the design work behind Bugatti's EB110 and 110 Super Sports cars through the sort of 80s, 90s, when Bugatti sort of had a bit of a renaissance. So, yeah, very important man when it comes to revolutionising the way we see Formula One bringing aerodynamic aids to it as much as it was the mechanics side of things. So very much a sort of proto-Adrian Newey. (laughs) He sort of, yeah, he sort of fell out of favour with Ferrari, didn't he, in sort of the 80s. He then moved to Bugatti and Lamborghini. Yeah, he had ties to Lamborghini and their F1 team for a short period before sort of moving from Lamborghini to Bugatti, which wasn't that big of a jump. The two were quite closely linked at the time. Yeah, and then didn't he sort of, didn't sort of have a job as such with Ferrari, but did he sort of come back? Remote Ish. design work. If if my yeah. if my if my Mauro Figari history is correct or Foggiari history is correct, I think he had like his own design and technical studio that basically occasionally Ferrari would sort of go to and he'd sort of look over a few pieces for them. I don't think I don't think he left with, by that point. There was too much animosity left, but Ferrari, especially under the old Enzo Ferrari days, was always a tricky tricky sort of setup to work under. And if you weren't performing a hundred percent all of the time, uh, Enzo was going to sort of come down on you pretty hard. And so depending on what year he came back, would it, be, would it be possible that the animosity wasn't there because Ferrari might have been dead by that point? Um, well, yeah, Which Ferrari died. it's pretty hard to stay mad at someone. Ferrari, Enzo Ferrari died around the time of the Ferrari F40, which is like 1984. I can't remember the dates off the top of my head. but I'm just really trying to push you on the, on the history here because I know it's, it's fun for me to do. I haven't got all the stats off the top of my head. Although I will say, isn't there an Enzo Ferrari film being made at the moment with Adam? Yeah, Drosper? Adam Drosper. Yeah. Mm, that's look. That looks to be quite good. I'm sure we'll have some more news on that when it when it gets close to the time. We should try and get like um, VIP tickets and go to the red carpet event. I think that'd be fun. Go to the premiere. Exactly. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> if the pit stop podcast isn't doing it, we ought to. If they it's can do it, we can dress up as well. <laughs> Yeah. Dig out my dick. Anyway, right? Jesse, it is time for your previously on. I feel like I've already done it really with a bit of my sort of Mauro Figueri. It, it, it would but... be if it was anything <laughs> relo- more remotely related to Brazil. But it, it's F1 history. This is the thing I absolutely love and sort of deep diving into the sort of the big book of statistics. Um, so obviously, when did we last go to the Brazilian Grand Prix? Although we say Brazilian Grand Prix, it is now known as the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. Last year was the first time we've called it the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. It was also the 49th. Oh, it's still the Brazilian Grand Prix. Still the Brazilian Grand Prix. It was the 49th running of a Grand Prix in Brazil. Obviously, we've had it at a few other circuits as well, but most everyone knows it for being held at Interlagos, which isn't even its proper name. It's better known as uh, uh, the Brazilian San, Grand Prix. Uh, Jose Carlos, Jose uh, Carlos Pache, isn't it? I think that's the one. Um, Your Spanish is flourishing it, from last week. It's every po- episode. My foreign languages are going to get better and better. Just you wait till I sort of dust off my Arabic for um, Abu Dhabi because it was brilliant. Isn't when I <laughs> Is Portuguese 13... in Brazil anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> is it the 39th held at Interlagos? But the 49th. Brazilian You're really trying Grand to test Prix? him today, aren't you, Adi, mate? Um, <laughs> it might be. Um, that is a very good question. Um, <laughs> wasn't, it, <laughs> wasn't it sort of, was it like 10 years of it being in Rio or something? We had, I think we started off at Interlagos back in the 70s. I was about to say I vaguely remember Fittipaldi running around there in the 70s, but I don't remember it because I was born in 97. You, you look um, old, but you're not that old. <laughs> then I know we went to, we had a year out, we went to, was it Jacarapaguea, I think is how it's pronounced. Again, my Portuguese is about as terrible as my French and Italian and nearly every other foreign language I try on this podcast. Then we go back to Interlagos and I think it bounces back to Jacarapaguea for a bit. And then eventually 19... Yeah, he keeps trying. He, an attempt was made. Then eventually, 1990, we um, start up again at Interlagos and haven't left it since, really. It was a slightly shortened circuit when we returned in 1990. But anyway, that's 
by the by. How did last year pan out? Uh, much like this year, it was a sprint weekend and coming into it, Max had a 19-point lead over Lewis. It was all getting a bit close with just three races left in the championship. The sprint points would become crucial in the overall outcome of the season, especially as Max would pick up essentially two bonus points while Lewis drove from P20 to P5 in the 24-lap sprint. A stellar performance and one that is still monstrously impressive. Lewis started P20 after a discrepancy in his DRS system saw him disqualified from qualifying but allowed to partake in the sprint at Stewart's discretion. Uh, his P5 would result uh, his P5 result would be undermined to come Sunday when he took a five place grid drop for exceeding his power unit cash. So uh yeah basically this man had 25 places no essentially 30 overtakes to make to try and get to the front of the grid ignoring sort of lapping and pit stops. In the race, Lewis pulled off another astounding drive from P10 to P1, coming home 10 seconds down the road from Max Verstappen after finally making it past the Dutchman after the two battled hard, most notably through turns four and five, uh, Desquida do, do Lago, again, trying it with the language, um, Max pushing Lewis wide each time as they came off the Reta Aposta. Lewis took the win. Amusingly, not as close as the Ferrari battle from a couple of years previously. It was like it was it was a bit of lunch at times last year, but at least they didn't take each other out in quite so spectacular style. <laughs> yeah, at least it wasn't that bit. But then, yeah, good that it wasn't that bit. But equally, I'd have loved to have known what audio element the drive to survive would have liked to have sort of clipped and patched into that section very badly to sort of dub it. But oh well, we never saw that. Um, like I said, Lewis took the win. Max P two and Bottas P three. The gaps gap between Max and Lewis now just 14 points at the weekend's end. So the real question is, who does the track favour historically? This largely means absolutely bugger all when it comes to predictions, but it's fun to look at the history. Um, since we've raced on the same layout since 1990, I've got plenty of data to work with. We had seven wins for Ferrari over the years. Prost in 1990, 2000 and 2002 were Schumacher wins, Massa in 2006 and 2008, Kimi in 07 and Seb in 2017. McLaren. Would that 2008 win be the last time Ferrari won in Brazil? Well, apart from 2017 with Seb. Like I just said. Oh, with Seb, I, oh, I completely just zoned out there. Fair enough. It's I was okay. too busy thinking about Kimi that I completely missed the Seb bit. Yeah, you sort of go back to Kimi 07, you sort of go, oh yeah, he wrapped up. I just assume with there. Ferrari these days that Kimi is the last one to do it. Last person who did so. anything. Yeah. No, Seb won in 2017. That was Ferrari's last win in Brazil. Uh, McLaren matched them numbers wise with seven wins. Senna at home in 91 and 93. Mika Hakkinen in 98 and 99. Coulthard in 01. Uh, Juan Pablo Montoya in 2005. And Jensen Button in 2012. So the last time McLaren won round there. Uh, Red Bull have not up five visits to the top step of the podium uh 09 10 11 13 and 19 as Weber Vettel Weber Vettel and Verstappen in that order Mercedes matched their rivals with five P1 finishes 14 15 16 18 and 2021 20, two for Rosberg and then three for Hamilton and that's the thing we always know Brazil as being a uh, Hamilton track and obviously in 16 when he's having that big fight with Rosberg he manages to seal the deal there and have a win against Rosberg so there's definitely a pattern forming for Lewis. Williams, odd enough, four wins. Mansell in 92, Hill in 96 on his way to the championship. Villeneuve repeated that the year later and Montoya in 2004. And Benetton also make the cut statistically on this one with two wins for Schumacher in 1994 and 1995. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I don't think we can really count on the Williams to be winning a race this weekend. Or unless, Benetton. Or Benetton, which is now technically Renault Alpine. So maybe, I don't know. Um, wouldn't uh, they might have a podium but I wouldn't say a race win so it's definitely a mixed bag but if we rely on the history this is purely down to Ferrari or McLaren the latter isn't hugely unlikely as Daniel and Lando have shown they can extract some fantastic pace from the MCL 36 but there's nothing more than a P3 that's been forthcoming to this point Ferrari do have a race winning car and it's a circuit where top speed something they lack compared to the Red Bull isn't as key as a strong drive yeah <laughs> That's staying in. <laughs> I'd like to get. Um, a... I need to have a point there, not just the cat. <laughs> Anything yeah, else about possum? Uh, the cat has now changed. This is Lola. Oh, just uh, it, it's a black cat. I mistook. It them. is a black cat. Possum's a lot quieter. Catist. So. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, only three drivers on the grid have won Brazil, which I think is kind of mad when you think about it. Especially when you think, yeah. 
when you think about the amount of time we've been racing there and how sort of long we've been racing there, the fact that yeah, it's the only other person I'd expect from the current grid would be Alonso. No one else I'd kind of expect. Danny Rick, to be honest. in the Red yeah, Bull for years, Ricardo. maybe. Yeah, for, I'd say the same for Bottas though with Mercedes. So yeah, true. I'm not as surprised at that as Ellie Bayer. Sorry, Ellie. <laughs> I mean, they've probably had podiums there, that's for certain, but just going by race wins, I didn't have enough time to rank through all the podium finishes in Brazil as well. Because over So we need to have a relatively podcast every once in a while. Yeah, I was going to say 32 years of uh, podiums to go through as well. That's going to be, what, three times three is not as well into the sort of nearly Sorry. 100 drivers. Don't, don't, don't. don't. <laughs> I, even, as much as I like my statistics, I'm not ranking out 100 drivers in a big list. Um, anyway, this is for whoever loses the pub quiz at the end of the year. You have to sit in a room with Jesse for an hour as he talks to you about this kind of stuff. <laughs> It's, it's like a torturous version of Ted's notebook. Um, the question is, what weather can we expect this weekend at Interlagos? Well, at the moment, bear in mind, we do record this on a Monday. Um, there is a thunderstorm forecast for Friday afternoon, which will be our conventional qualifying. So worth watching out for that. We could have a damp quality. Um, then there's an 85% chance of rain through Saturday with some more storms rolling through as well. And then a 70% chance of rain on race day as well with pretty full coverage. So... It's looking like it's going to be a slightly soggy race in um, Sao Paulo. So there's definitely going to be some uh, fumbled alliteration from Crofty as much as I managed to do on there. Ordinarily, I'd be up for that. But considering the wet races we've had this year, I don't know if I want that now. <laughs> if it's somewhere between Japan and Singapore on like a balance for getting racing action, but also... There's quite extreme differences. Action, <laughs> yeah, I'd like some, somewhere in the middle would be That's good. like dry or wet. <laughs> Yeah, it's worse. I think just something in the middle would be a good balance. The real question, though, is which on track battles should we look out for? Um, if we look back at some of the more recent data instead of my canter through the history books, it's more likely going to be a Red Bull Ferrari fight in qualifying. And hopefully they'll be able to battle that through the sprint, keeping things close before the Ferrari tears its tyres to shreds. We know the Ferrari seems to be struggling to keep its tyres in one piece at the moment. They really do seem to have to sort of essentially go for the undercut, as it were, but it's just them not being able to keep their tyres going. Um, Mercedes looks set to be a lot closer to the action, though. Their re recent rounds of upgrades saw them very close in Mexico, especially. So if they can keep pace with that and have a good setup for Sao Paulo, they might do well. And especially if Ferrari can't keep their tyres running to an optimum strategy and make some now unsurprising pit stop gaffes, Mercedes could well be on for a pit stop finish. The real question is, though, will it be the top step? McLaren versus Alpine is still... You just put Ferrari in optimum strategy in the same sentence. I said that it's unlike, yeah, if if Ferrari can't keep their tyres running to an optimum strategy. That if so you're, they, you're saying it like it's possible. Essentially what I'm saying is they will have a plan written out, but they will never follow the plan. It will never go to the plan because Ferrari. I'm just making sure you're clarifying because I don't want people turning off thinking that you know, that you think Ferrari know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. That's how, I, we, that's how we lose listeners, Jesse. We are fully aware <laughs> that Ferrari don't know what they're doing at this point. We we know more of what Ferrari is doing. The Ferrari know what Ferrari is doing. I think is the key element to this. Um, outside the top three, obviously, I've said McLaren versus Alpine is set to be the big battle. And frankly, it's too close to call at this point. I genuinely couldn't wouldn't put money either way on those two teams. Um, on the right tyres last time out, Danny Rick demolished the pace of the Alpines. He went absolutely flying past Esteban Ocon. And it's impressive. It's good to see him have a good run in the McLaren. And again, it proves that if he gets given a good strategy, he can pull some performance out of that car. So don't count him out as much as I'd say don't count out the Alpines or Lando Norris. Although I'm still sitting on my idea of Pierre Gasly torpedoing um, Lando <laughs> Norris to serve a race ban for Abu Dhabi and thus arrive at Alpine next season, minty, fresh and clean with no penalty points on his licence. Um, the other one I'm saying to watch out for is going to be Alex Albon in the Williams. If it's not a windy day and just wet, it's going to be conditions that are quite favourable to that Williams car. And he hasn't had points for a little while, so he could be one to keep an eye on. We got quite close recently in the last couple of Grand Prix as well, so third time the charm, let's go for that. Yeah, the pace has definitely been there with his car, so he should be able to extract a little bit around, again, a circuit where the top end isn't quite as valuable. And if it's not windy, the car should prove to be plenty stable enough, even in the damp. So fingers crossed for Alex Albon coming into this weekend, which leads us neatly into our predictions, rather. Yeah, and we're going to start with pole position. And as we've not heard from you a little bit, Jenny, who do you think is going to be pole position this weekend? I'm going to go for Verstappen for pole. A bold choice. I'm sorry, it's not. It's, I know. It's a sensible choice. <laughs> I've, 
Sleep's <laughs> gone out of the box there. Oh, fair enough. And um, Eddie, may you uh, have kind of gone down the same route? Yeah, I completely agree. I think whilst Hamilton is very good on this track, I don't think we can forget how good Verstappen is on this track as well. He got pole in 2019 and then went on to win it. And he does have that infamous moment in 2016 in the wet where mm-hmm. he saves his car pretty well. Yeah, impressive and annoying in equal measure if you wanted something slightly interesting to happen there and he just saves it like, oh, come on, don't tease us like this. Crash or don't crash. Just don't do a half ass job of it. <laughs> Mind you, if you do want a Verstappen crash in uh, Brazil, you can rely on Esteban Ocon for that. Spicy. Spicy. It's not my and world prediction. He, and he could lap him. He could lap him as well to do a proper repeat of it. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I just say, that, you, what's, whatever your bold prediction is, Jesse, change it. <laughs> change it to that. Mm. We'll see when we get to the bold predictions. We'll go. We'll put it to a group vote as to whether or not I change it to Max Verstappen laps us by Ocon and Ocon crashes into Verstappen as he comes past him for a second time. You, Jesse, you're making that a group vote in about 10 minutes' time. Uh, in the meantime, who are you putting on for pole position, Jesse? Charles Leclerc, uh, he's got a good pole record this season. Not that means anything in his overall standings, but again, the Ferrari, I reckon over one lap is going to be faster and Charles will be able to get something out of that car to put it on pole. Whether or not, again, he can fight off Verstappen through the process of a sprint race even is going to be a different question, let alone the entire race. So yeah, pole position for Charles, I feel isn't overly ambitious, but ultimately it doesn't mean anything when it comes to the race win. No, and... uh... In the spirit of being equally ambitious and kind of both bouncing off what you were saying, anyway, Lewis Hamilton is who I'm going to go for for pole position just because it's about darn time this season that he gets one and Brazil would be the place to do it. He does absolutely love the track and maybe fueled a bit by the energy from last year. I could see it happening. And if you've, I just need the Red Bulls and the first to have a bit of a tussle and be so focused on each other that they forget about Lewis. I'm like, oh shit, yeah, he could actually really it. So that's that's where I'm going for my money this weekend. Well, I mean, he's going to be coming into the weekend on a bit of a high because he picked up his like official citizenship of Brazil or mm. something, or his honorary citizenship of Brazil early, honorary earlier today when we were um, recording. So he'll be he'll have he'll definitely have like essentially a home crowd behind him in the same way that Max calls. And, and it's just had a bit of fun things. with uh, Russell in Vegas launching that. So he's probably in quite a in a calm, happy mood about it. And essentially as again, Mercedes they made the step up, but they don't really have anything to lose because they're not going to lose P3 mm. in the constructor standings. And they can just kind of spoil the party for everyone. So why not do it in Brazil and have a proper mm. party? They know how to do it down there. Just dropping this now as a point we I really want us to circle back to, but did anyone see any of the footage from that Las Vegas sort of opener where they sort of had all the drones yes. in the sky? It looked terribly gauche, to say the phrase. I thought it looked tacky. Vegas tacky? Never. Never. <laughs> what are you on about? <laughs> Anyway, we'll, we'll circle back around to this once we've made the rest of our predictions. We'll go to the podium next. And Jenny, who do you think is going to be standing on those three steps? I think it's going to be Hamilton for win. And I oh, think I like it's going to be one. very close between him and Verstappen. And then I think Perez in third. And Verper, a 2021 podium if there ever was one. <laughs> Ooh. I'm going to have to echo. I'm going to just jump ahead there because I was thinking, am I too bold to be the only one to go for Lewis for the win here? But no, no, Jenny's with me on this one. But I've changed the rest of the podium slightly. So Hamilton win, Russell in second, and then Max in third. In, uh, in, in, yeah, because you know, it doesn't matter so much, but at the same time, he gets comfortably beaten by both of these two for a change. Be nice. Be nice to shake things up a bit. Brazil would go mad if Hamilton won. I mean, they've already gone a bit oh, mad at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there, Jesse. <laughs> if they were to it's have one of those some, podcasts. some energetic street performances of exuberance, I don't think there'd be much left of Sao Paulo and the surrounding areas at this point, but we'll wait and see. Tell us who's on your podium pol- instead before you get into trouble, Jesse. <laughs> That's me trying to be really political. Um, my podium, Charles Leclerc win, George Russell second, Lando Norris third. I can see it being a bit of a crazy one. And maybe Ferrari pull something out of the bag. Just maybe. Again, this is optimism. This is hope. This isn't fact or science or statistics. This is just, just damn tired. This hope. is Jesse's tired after a long weekend. <laughs> this is just want a race win from Ferrari, all right? I just want them to win a race. God damn it. How hard uh, is it? He's definitely a Ferrari fan. You can hear the pain in his voice from the last how many years has it been? <laughs> Since 2007. 
<laughs> Ellie May, let's let's just put him at his misery and utility you want on the podium. Fifteen years. It took me that long to do the math. Fifteen years. You you sound like Sirius Black from Prisoner of Azkaban. <laughs> Ellie May, your podium before I get really upset. Uh, I've gone for Verstappen win, Hamilton in second, and Alonso in third. I think, well, looking at how quick Alpine can be when they want to be, you think about from turn 12 to turn one, it's a heck of a long, like, full throttle part of the track if they can get their straight lines well it's not straight line because it's not a straight curved line speed yeah if they can get their curved line speed up to as good as they have previously then I reckon they could be there not a far out shell I mean we do see an Alonso podium we saw one crop up in Qatar last year it doesn't take much to have that go on the podium I've got to say when yeah, I was looking at I, these earlier I thought I saw Norris on your podium and I saw Alonso on any and I thought well I weirdly thought Alonso seems the less ballsy for a prediction <laughs> yeah I thought I was seeing as I went quite safe with Verstappen and Hamilton I thought why not you've got enough of a points lead in the standings to sort of take that gamble <laughs> You could, I, have, you could yeah. have predicted Schumacher, Magnussen and Latifi as your podium, scored nothing this weekend and still be leading oh. by a good shot. Now you're making me depressed, Jesse. <laughs> everyone gets one. Talking of everyone gets one, fastest lap. I am going to channel what I've been channeling for the entire predictions thing so far and go for Lewis Hamilton. Fastest lap. Why not? It's Brazil. Same reasons as before. Not far out, but it does rely on that Mercedes being fast, which it hasn't truly been all season. No, but at the same time, George Russell has been very good with the end fastest lap. So again, if he's got a big enough gap out front, then there's no reason why not just stick on a couple pair of softs and well, two pairs of softs. But you know, uh, it'd be weird to just stick on two softs and leave the other two players and against the rules. But that's by the by, and just go out and do the what he can do when he's on top of his game. That's true. I forgot. I forgot. George Russell's had a few fastest laps come through. Oh, I don't know. It's doable. And so I'd say it's more doable than the win. Well, I still say it's more doable than your fastest lap because that Fernando requires his engine not to blow up. Fernando Alonso. Ellie May literally just said this for her the third part of her podium, and you didn't shoot her down. But <laughs> no, but I, we're, we're getting on all right for this episode of the podcast. I want to keep it that way. <laughs> and oh, so you- plus, every time he's had a dig at me. Lola has literally meowed at him. So <laughs> I've not noticed that to be fair. Ominous <laughs> ma- meowing in the background on Ellie May's audio. There's a cat judging me right now. I wonder how that'll sound yes. when I put the podcast sort of audio filter on it in um, Premiere Pro. We'll wait and see. <laughs> anyway, you've gone for Alonso for your fastest lap for better or worse. He'll do it in the first 12 laps for his engine. Let's go. And it'll just stay that way for no one else to beat it. Yeah, then there'll be safety cars, rain, chaos. Um, yeah, I can see that happening. We mentioned George earlier, Lily May. Yeah, I've gone for George Russell. Whoever put next to it, if it ain't broke, precisely that. Thank you. That was my point. Yeah, I mean, to counteract your Lewis Hamilton one, George Russell has always been in a position where he can kind of pit the few laps to go yeah. put a pair of softs on and go for it whilst I don't know whether Hamilton will be in that position but we don't know we'll see I mean it's, it's you look more likely of the two of us on that one for sound logic but I'm doing an exercise and I'm believing here so I'm just going to go with that and uh, Jenny fastest lap for you I've gone for signs for similar reasons Ooh. the reason you've gone for Russell it's not exactly um, the best way to get past this lap, but I do think he's going to be <laughs> sixth. <clears throat> so it's not pit. much for this honest work. <laughs> so he might uh, might just want that extra point on top of the eight that you get for six. Well, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> <laughs> but... I kind of see Jesse's what Jesse's smile of grimace there as well. <laughs> 
She's not wrong. I, this is the worst part. Yeah. Of it. She's not wrong. I can see the strategy going wrong. He drops back to seventh eventually because of the natural gap between the top six. Get ahead, hit just as like a compensation point for the strategy. Yeah, I definitely see where you're coming from because if you think the reason George Russell's been pitting for the fastest lap is to get that extra point away from what Leclerc and Perez. So mm. science can easily do that because now he's in a battle with Hamilton. He's in a battle with both Mercedes, really. They're both very close to him on points. So it'll be interesting to see quite how that I guess he's diplomatic way of saying behind. <laughs> I'm not going to admit it. I'm in, I'm in denial, okay? <laughs> At the start of the year, I predicted that man would be winning the championship and now he's in sick. Denial. Said, age 12, is it? No. And I said Ferrari look like they have a world championship winning car. So. Oh, yeah. no, they do, Eddie May. That's the worst part of it. <laughs> they do. They just don't know how to use it properly. You do, Ella, you yeah. should be grateful that you weren't here at the start of the season when Timo and I did our big sort of season predictions because... Uh, That's not going to be good reading, I tell you now. I haven't filled in many of them as green on the big Excel sheet. <laughs> no, you it's, haven't. Oh, dear. A lot of them are actually red. Um, just, uh. We'll move on to world predictions, which reading what I've written here... Is a surprise to me because I thought I predicted this for Abu Dhabi. So I'm very surprised with what I've predicted for Abu Dhabi now. I have no idea what that's. How about. have you forgotten? Um, it was quite a wet prediction I, for Abu Dhabi. Well, yeah, that just means I must have been high on ketamine at the time. I don't know. We'll find out because if it's bonk, more bonkers than this, then I'll be very intrigued to see that when we record that. Anyway, for this one, Brazil. I have predicted, and I must not want points here because all of this has to happen for me to get one point. I'm going to say that Vettel, Ricardo, Ocon, and Sainz, which is already getting screwed up by James Fastest Lap and the whole story there, they all finish higher than their teammates in the Grand Prix. Which means they've got to beat Stroll. Okay, pretty easy. But then Norris and Alonso and Leclerc. So either I'm a genius and we will find out in a less than a week's time or I am just classic top gear and ambitious but rubbish okay. I don't want to massage your ego but let's see Vettel beating Stroll easy Ricardo beating Norris Gasly torpedoes Norris in the first turn and thus so that plan plays out so Ricardo immediately finishes ahead of him <coughs> Ocon finishing ahead of Alonso <coughs> I'm choking my own spit <coughs> Ocon finishing ahead of Alonso, easy. Alonso's engine's going to die. Science finishing ahead of Leclerc, Ferrari, yeah. fuck up the strategy. It's don't give me hope. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm just like. saying. Unless, yeah. unless Ocon comes second, which makes Alonso still in third for my podium prediction. I don't want it. <laughs> That's the only way you you'll allow that. Yeah. <laughs> An interesting weekend indeed. Why Jesse. didn't you add? Why didn't you add Perez to that? Why did you go for like the better Ricardo or Science? Why did you not think Perez? He I wanted a chance. Anyway. I made this prediction back in August, and I don't know what my logic was. I again, I thought I'd done this for Abu Dhabi because it was the last race of the season, and three out of four of these drivers would not be either with the team they are with next year or in the sport. And Science, I just wanted to be nice to him. So what happened to fact, Ocon? Yeah, what did what did you predict happening to Ocon? No, I meant Wait, because Alonso. No, I meant because Alonso's leaving, so I just oh. thought it'd be fun for him oh. to, to beat him. Oh, fun to be beaten okay. in like his penultimate in his last race. Yeah, yeah. Because oh, I was annoyed okay. with him going to Aston Martin. Uh -huh. So you're asking me to justify past Timo's decisions, and I can't do that right now. <laughs> I don't think just past Timo is going to be able to justify these decisions. Well, it doesn't matter. He's in the past. He doesn't matter now. So, Jesse, move and swiftly on and give us your world prediction. Um, well, obviously, what I've written on the big Google Doc that we use to put all this together is, if the above isn't spicy enough for you, then how about double Hass points? Ninth and tenth, doable. Okay, yeah. I, gonna... I want to I wanna hear your logic. I don't know. I just figured there's going to be enough chaos that the two of them are just somehow... And they're not going to be caught up in it. <laughs> They're going to be far enough down the order that the chaos happens ahead of them when they just simply trundle past. I think trundle is the best trundle way of describing... Trundle being an operative word. <laughs> it is. It's the best way of describing a Hass at a race weekend is simply trundling. Maybe 
for some reason they have to start in the pit lane. Exactly. Everyone else crashes in front of them and they just go past. They come out of the pit lane, P1 oh, and P2. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> they just look around like, what's happened? It's sort of, oh, no, oh okay, right. I, I wouldn't put it past them to somehow muck it up from there because it is at the end of the day has. But everyone, everyone crashes into the first three corners, they come out, turn four, drive into each other. No one finishes. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I just think I think has double points is doable. Although you were going to try and back me into a decision earlier on, which I can't remember what it was now. Uh, Ocon yes. going into Verstappen. Yes, Ocon going it. into Verstappen as Verstappen laps him down into the S's. Okay, because of course at this point I'm now third in our sort of predictions championship. I've not really got anything to lose and or win at this point. Ellie May is getting the Fredo Frog of champions, so. <laughs> Do I trade my Haas double points for Ocon gets lapped by Verstappen? And then tries unlapping himself and crashes into him. Yes. Jenny, does he do it? I don't know which one's more unlikely, to be quite honest. (laughs) (laughs) I love the fact that Haas double points is on the same level as that. (laughs) Go for it, go for it. It's happened before. Did I have to fit that all in a little box on our little sort of predictions? Just put Ocon Verstappen and we'll know what you mean. (laughs) When did it happen? 2017? Something around there. Just put put that. Ocon Verstappen. Just history repeats itself. Yeah. And Max collide as history repeats. I see that with you, Ellie May, though, you are trying to help me slightly with your world prediction. Mine's just, I've been in pain since Austria (laughs) and gone into a downward spiral. And I may as well get a point out of it and say at least one Ferrari is out of the top ten. Which would suit me just fine if it's Charles Leclerc. Well... I like the open-endedness of it also being at least one Ferrari. Because, of course, Ferrari (laughs) have a habit in Brazil of them both being out of the top 10 and thus also out of the race. So you As as long as Leclerc crashes first, then... Or retires first, then I still technically get my thing for him finishing ahead in the official standings. So I will take that ambiguous thing from Ellie Bay there of at least one. (laughs) It's I need the points if I'm going to try and make any kind of challenge to it with two races to go. So you've got you've got a gap of five points to make up. I've got a gap of seven. It's not happening, mate. Yeah, that's why it's not happening for you. But I got to give it a good old college try. <laughs> but, at uh, the minute, at the minute, I'm Red Bull. Jesse is mm-hmm. Ferrari. Timo is mm-hmm. Mercedes. No, Timo's mm-hmm. closer. I'm Mercedes. Timo's Ferrari. No, no, no because I, I, you're Ferrari. No, no, no. My track record this season, I just overtook you. So Yeah, you were in the lead at one point. I was. And then I came along. I've not been in the lead at all. Yeah, Ellie anyway, Mae came in late to the whole thing. A bit like Red Bull. Technically Red Bull did as well. With their two yeah. yeah. Of, you know. <laughs> oh, God. Jenny, what a prediction from you before we descend into chaos again? Uh, I think since it's raining, well, probably raining, I'm going to go for Latifi getting a point. And not just one, actually. I'm going to go for more than one. Emphasis Ooh. on the surfer points then. Okay. Mm-hmm. Latifi win here we come. How many points has Alvin got? Four? Yeah, honestly. So, four. Where's the big spreadsheet? And so he's got to do what he did to George last year in a way and somehow get more points than him for, for a while. Yeah, if, I think... if it wasn't for George's P2 at Spa, he would have finished ahead of him. Mm. Yeah, Albon's on four points at the moment. Latifi is currently on two. So mm. if he got like seventh or higher, then he would overtake Albon in the cham- championship. Imagine that. <sighs> and then just drops Mike in leaves. I was going to say, he yeah. just goes out, goes out on an absolute high like a boss. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if Latifi doesn't score any more points, he'll have had, what, uh, nine points in total across his career. Won't have broken double figures. Mike drops and walks out at the end of Abu Dhabi. Job done. 
Is that what would be even more Web impressive page? if Philly then does join IndyCar and wins it next year? Oh, just outright, just makes this season look like the most. It just makes this season look like 2012, beginning of the F1 season, then just does a Vettel 2013 for the last nine races, but does it all season long. But you've got to bear in mind because that puts him up against the likes of Roman Grosjean, who was scoring podiums when he was with Lotus against Kimi Raikkonen. Yes, but so then all of a sudden you've got Latifi beating Grosjean, a man who could at the best go toe to toe with an F1 world champion. Then it sort of skews by proxy your view of Kimi Raikkonen's F1 ability. If you use enough leaps to get there. Yeah, but my legs aren't as long as yours, so I can't make those leaps. Yeah, I'm just sort of going for sort of limitless Jason Bourne thinking here, but yeah. And on that weird note, do we have anything else we want to say before we conclude this episode of the podcast? Do we want to relate s- to Brazil, maybe? I was going to say, do you want to slam the Las Vegas Grand Prix and it's like opening gambit thing? Or do we just know that it's going to be terrible and move on? You excited for it, Jenny? Vegas? Yay, nay? Um, neither. <laughs> or <laughs> I am the only thing that I've seen that's kept me optimistic is what Russell said this morning about it being a good track for racing even though it's not necessarily exciting to drive things along the lines of what he said it's a very basically, interesting comment in bombs. itself that's quite basically it's going to be a lot of dive bomb turns but dive bomb overtakes basically because you've got that massive straight where you're pinging it off the limiter in eight and then basically dive bomb it into a left hander isn't it a 90 degree left yeah. In which case, then, bold prediction for Las Vegas next year if we're going for dive bombs. Do you say this. Perez and Verstappen wipe each other out? I'm going to find wherever you are and strangle you. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't. I was going to say someone gets ill and Ricardo fits in, sits in for them and does what Ricardo does best and dive bombs past everyone at some point during the Grand Prix and absolutely wins that like a boss and then leaves again because he's got to go back to let the normal person get back in their seat. Or so tries to actually, out Verstappen goes in the back of Verstappen. Verstappen he does that the best. Verstappen. How about we go to Las Vegas, we get Piastri really drunk. Ricardo then has to fill in, wins the Las Vegas Grand Prix in a McLaren, the team that obviously kicked him out of F1, and then just leaves. And doesn't. Are you happy with him retiring after that? <laughs> That's the way you're making it sound there. No. Look at the conflict on her face as she tries to decide. <laughs> I just think, yeah. Uh, he just, just doesn't have to... have to elaborate any further, does he? Comes in, wins, true. leaves. I did just have to check that um, Piastri is old enough to drink in Vegas and he is, he's 21 at the moment. So that's fine. So we're not breaking any laws there. How old is Logan Wait. Sturgeon? Um, good question. Because that would be He'll funny. be 21 either this year or next year. Uh, he's already 21. Oh. December 31st, 2000. Oh, we're old. Mm. We are old. Very old. On that terrible disappointment, we're going to ignore Vegas, focus back on Brazil, and we'll just hope that uh, Brazil is more exciting than Las Vegas, which surely is an absolute certainty. So, as I said, that's all we have time for on this week's episode. But you can find more of us in many places, and we're going to kick off with our special guest, Jenny. If people want to find you other than on this podcast in this episode, where can people find you? Uh, inside F2 or on Instagram, or on Twitter, both of them, my name with a 43. Perfect. Ellie May. I feel like such a fraud saying mine, because it's just <laughs> not true. <laughs> you can change that at any point, by the way. We just put it there and we all edit these notes. You could even you can just... You could say whatever you say want. It. Yeah. Know, There's no but, contract here. I know, but I'm also trying to think... Where can I be found? And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> For those of you who are not regular listeners, Ellie may often goes off on a philosophical rant around at the end of the podcast about where people can find her and in what capacity. Ellie May's Philosophy Corner. This week, the you, writings of Nabachok. You can find me at the dentist. I'm going there tomorrow. 
I, I guess well. so, yeah. Jesse, where can people find you? Um, <laughs> I got nothing for that. Yeah, I got nothing. My improv um, skills are not quite there yet. If you, if you want to find more of me, you can find me across the internet on Instagram and Twitter. Just look for Jesse on Cars. And if you want more of my work in more of a physical format, you can buy Classic Car Weekly. We've got a new issue out on Wednesday. It's got all my pictures from the London to Brighton run in it, as well as uh, David, my editor's story, as he rode along in a 1904 Dirac from uh, Hyde Park to Madeira Drive. Plus, we've got a preview of the Classic Motor Show at the NEC, which is going on this weekend. Mostly, I'm only working the Friday and Saturday, so I've got the Sunday to watch the Grand Prix. I was very clear about that when I sort of booked out that weekend. So yeah, if you want more of me, to. you can find me on the internet and in print format. As for myself, if you want to find more of me, I write for Is It First and Paddock Authority, and I have my other couple of podcasts, the Nitro RX podcast and On The Curbs, where there's an interview out with W Series' Chloe Chambers, and I am obviously on Instagram as well. We'll stick all of the details for all four of us in the description to this episode, so you don't have to listen back to us for all of that. And we will see you again next week for our review of the Brazilian Grand Prix. So we shall see you then. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.